Laser sights are an essential firearms training tool, clearly correcting and improving the two most important shooting fundamentals, aiming and trigger control. Crimson Trace, making laser sights standard equipment. Learn more at crimsontrace.com. Welcome to Tom Gresham's Gun Talk, where there's more to talk about than shooting. There's reloading and hunting and self-defense, too. Hey, welcome back. Tom Gresham here. It's Gun Talk. We're going to be talking about, well, what do you think, guns, ammo, and self-defense? Sure. If you want to talk about hunting, we can certainly do that. Rifles, shotguns, pistols, all of it. Pretty much anything is available as long as we talk about using guns safely and responsibly because we are, in fact, the good guys and the good gals. <laughs> We're the ones that often don't make the news. People who misuse guns make the news, but the tens of millions, more than 100 million of us who own guns safely and responsibly, we're kind of just quiet out here, nothing to see, move on. You know, of course, that it's been, I don't know, 20, 25 years, probably a quarter of a century since the the concealed carry movement, and I call it exactly that, really started. And I've watched a state after state past laws allowing good people to carry guns for their own protection, men and women with varying degrees of restrictions on training and where you can carry and all the rest of it. But it's been an interesting journey. It drives the gun ban lobby crazy. The very idea that regular people are protecting themselves with firearms. It's stunning. One of the people who has chronicled that in articles and in books is our next guest. Chris Bird is the author of the brand new seventh edition of the Concealed Handgun Manual. Chris, how are you, sir? I'm fine, Tom. I enjoy being with you as always. Well, you, uh, the seventh edition of the Concealed Handgun Manual, this one, of course, thicker than all the rest, more information. It has been developed. You, know, you are, in fact, a, a firearms instructor. Uh, as we like to say, you may be a Texan, but uh, you don't sound like you're a Texan. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's what people do tell me from time to time. I, I've actually been accused of of coming of uh, being from Massachusetts, of all places. <laughs> but uh, I, I must say, I have lived in Texas for longer than I've lived in any other place. Uh, Amazing. So this is home. <laughs> okay. All right. One of the things I want to ask you, and I've been flipping through uh, the latest edition. Of course, I've, I have every edition of the Concealed Handgun Manual. We started talking about that when the very first one came out. One of the things that you have done, I'd like to ask you about, is as we have had more and more states, and now we have all the states, theoretically, where you could carry, um, you have actually been in the lead of chronicling Good people using guns in self-defense. And you have a lot of those stories here. You have in your book, Thank God I Had a Gun, which is a great book. Surviving a Mass Killer Rampage is another one of your books. Question for you. As a, as a guy who teaches concealed carry, and this is an excellent book, I would recommend the Concealed Hanging Manual to anybody thinking about either getting into concealed carry or even if you've been doing it a long time because there's a lot of things you don't know. But to what extent has it changed your approach to both teaching and to carry, as you have talked to so many people who've used guns successfully in self-defense? I don't think it's changed my basic outlook. Um, I I have been carrying as uh, long as it's been legal to do so here in Texas, even uh, just before I became an instructor. Mm -hmm. Um, But, uh, uh, yeah, uh, all of these people uh, that I've interviewed have... uh, usually successfully uh, been able to resolve something. Um, I know that uh, I think in in, uh, what we're required to teach uh, to get a concealed, well, it used to be a concealed handgun license. Now it's a license uh, to carry an LTC Mm -hmm. uh, because we have open carry in uh, in Texas now. Uh Um, But... uh, uh, I uh, I haven't changed my view about that, um, uh, although I, in theory, I support open carry. Uh, it's not something that I would do in uh, in public if I was on uh, hunting or something like that on private land. Sure. Uh, sure. That that uh, might well be an option, but uh, 
Um, I think that uh, a gun um, should be a surprise. Uh, you shouldn't go mm. around advertising it. It has been said, although I don't have any um, documentation on this, that a uh, bad guy comes in to rob a restaurant or whatever, um, and uh, you're carrying a gun out there in the open, you're the first person he's going to shoot. Well, you know, I've heard that said. I don't know that it actually works that way. I mean, and I actually do know of cases where they've come in, seen somebody open carrying, and turned around and left. Uh, at, you know, so there there may be that. But what I was thinking actually was in terms of people who – you've talked to so many people and re- reported on so many people who've used guns successfully. Sometimes they had to shoot, shoot. Sometimes they didn't have to shoot at all. But, I mean, they've actually saved their lives, saved other people's lives. Uh, I just wonder in terms of the – imperative of always carrying and that this stuff, I guess the thing that I get out of it is that evil can pop up anywhere. Oh, absolutely. And one of the things that uh, I hear from other instructors and I've heard myself is people who say, well, I'll just carry it when I think I need it. Well, I uh, certainly disagree with that uh, that attitude. I think uh, if if you're going to carry, um, uh, as you said, evil can strike uh, any place at uh, at any time, even in your own home. We uh, uh, we have a, a term now for something that's probably been going on for a long time, but it hasn't had an actual name, and it's not uh, catalogued in crime statistics. It's called the home invasion, mm-hmm. and uh, you can be sitting watching your television um, or eating your dinner, and several people will just uh, break uh, through your front door and and. Uh, uh, hold you up or or, uh, or even kill you, uh, as has happened many times. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so uh, what are you going to do? Do you have a gun available, handy, when you're sitting watching television? Well, and so uh, often, do, to, to your point, it, it is so often it is multiple. It's not one person. It's three or four or five people in a home invasion. And, of course, their plan is to overwhelm you to come blowing in there, and then there's so many of them, they just basically take the, the fight out of you. And if you if all you have is, you know, the book that you're reading, then, yeah, they're going to win, and they get to do anything they want to do, whether it's hurt you, rape you, or cut you into pieces. There's nothing you can do about it. If you don't, Honestly, if you don't have a firearm handy, by handy, I think both of us are talking about can you reach it from where you are at this moment? Absolutely, yeah. I, I, uh, I wear uh, a gun all the time, and, uh, and, and that's one of the reasons. Um, mm-hmm. It would look particularly stupid for somebody who teaches this stuff to, uh, <laughs> uh, to, to be a victim of that very same uh, sort of uh, attack. And uh, there was one particular horrendous, deal um, that uh, happened to a family by the name of Pettit in Connecticut uh, several years ago, and uh, that was where um, two hardened criminals decided to do a home invasion. First of all, they staked out a uh, um, a, uh, uh, shopping center, and they waited till they saw uh, a woman uh, and her daughter getting into, I think it was an upscale Mercedes. Mm-hmm. That looks like a good, uh, uh, a good prospect. So they followed her home. She didn't notice this. This is one of the things that uh, situational awareness mm-hmm. should give you a clue to, although you can't really blame um, the you woman blame or the her daughter for not noticing. Yeah. They followed her home, and then later that night, um, they did a home invasion. They tied up her husband. Uh, he survived, but uh, um, the woman, her daughters, were uh, raped, murdered, and the house was set on fire. The mm-hmm. husband managed to uh, to get away, but uh, the other the other three members of his family were dead, and uh, the police caught them. Um, 
pretty much at the end of the block. But uh, it was it was too late, and it's those sort of things that uh, uh, you know. This this was an upscale community in Connecticut right. where you just don't expect that it, sort of thing to happen. It, it, it was a safe neighborhood, Chris. It was a safe neighborhood. That's people say. I live in a safe area. You know, I don't have to worry about that. Hey, hold on a second here, Chris. We're talking with Chris Bird. He's the author of the Concealed Handgun Manual. When we come back, I want to talk about uh, how has equipment changed, and, and and basically, what are we looking at for good choices for uh, concealed handguns these days, and if there's anything else that we need to know with his long history of uh, looking at this, what can we learn? We're talking with Chris Bird, the Concealed Handgun Manual. I'm Tom Gresham. If you'd like to be a part of this, give us a holler right now, 866-TALK-GUN. Be right back. When the U.S. military's elite units and law enforcement agencies across the globe demanded innovation and reliability, they didn't settle. They chose Sig Sauer. When world champion professional shooters demanded precision accuracy, they didn't settle. They chose Sig Sauer. So it's no surprise more and more civilian gun owners are refusing to settle for anything less. They're choosing Sig Sauer firearms, ammunition, electro optics, suppressors, air guns, and training. Sig Sauer. Never settle. Tired of searching the web for the best deals on guns, ammunition, and gear? Download the free Gun Dealio app today for deals and discounts right at your fingertips. Handguns, rifles, shotguns, ammo, optics, lasers, gun safes, targets, gun cleaners, grips, slings, and much, much more. Save money on products you want from the companies you love. New deals, discounts, and rebates added daily. Gun Dealio, available for free in the App Store and Google Play. Attacks happen every day. How will you react? See real people put into real-life criminal attack situations on First Person Defender. Discover what works and what doesn't. Kidnapping, ATM robbery, home invasion, and other attacks. Learn how to save your life and the lives of your family. Get the entire first season on DVD at ShopGunTalk.com. Get prepared. ShopGunTalk.com. We're talking with Chris Bird. He's the author of the Concealed Handgun Manual. And Chris, as I'm flipping through the book and looking at it, it occurs to me, we now have a lot of states where we have constitutional carry, where you're not required to get any training. And then we have, of course, various states, you have to have varying levels of training. And I'm just going to throw this out to anybody if you conceal carry, if you even if you don't carry, if you have a gun in your home for self-defense or in your car, uh, I would recommend the book, especially for people who have no training whatsoever. Because, I mean, you are not only cover, like, different guns and how they work and different calibers and how to shoot, but also things like what to do at a traffic stop. Things that a lot of times are covered in a concealed carry class, but may or may not be. And if you didn't have to have a class at all... You don't know the stuff that you and I assume you know what to do. When you get pulled over by the police on a traffic stop and you're carrying a gun, what do you do? So that's the kind of things you have in this book. Yes, and I think um, one of the things that, uh, that goes through my mind um, and, and did while I was writing it is if you're in a, uh, a constitutional carry situation or you don't have to have any sort of training, uh, to get a license to carry uh, concealed or in the mm-hmm. open for that matter, then I think uh, you need to either take uh, uh, some sort of training class um, on your, even if you've got to pay for it, um, or uh, maybe read my book. I was trying to answer all the questions that somebody would have who uh, either wants to carry concealed or already does. And uh, one of the things I think that uh, uh, people uh, really don't think about much is, okay, you've shot somebody, you've defended yourself successfully. Now the police are about to arrive. What do you do and what do you not do? Mm -hmm. Uh, The last thing you really want to, uh, to, to be faced with is the police arrive and 
you have somebody lying on the ground, dead or badly wounded, and you're standing over them with a gun in your hand. Uh, the police don't know that you're the good guy, and right. uh, you can well get shot. In and those it's happened sort of before. Situations. And it has yeah. happened. Yeah. 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 So, so yeah, no, and then and then it's a case of okay, now what do you do? Because what you do in the next thirty minutes may determine where you get to live for the next thirty years. Indeed, absolutely. You know, you, are you going to be a uh, you know a ward of the state? Are you going to be living in the prison? Or are you going to be going home eventually when you get through all this deal? And what you do? And the thing is, this is not a time for improvisation. You need to know. You need to have practiced it. You need, and by practice, I mean you need to be. If nothing else, you sit in your easy chair at home and you go through, this is what I'll do. I will say this, I will do that. How do I know what to do? Well, you get Chris's book, for heaven's sakes. That's how you know. And you get training. Well, I think, uh, yeah, that's important. One, one of the things that uh, I would encourage is people to actually practice out loud what they will say on, um, when, when they call 911. Mm. Um, you want to say... Um, a certain amount, not too much. Uh, you don't want to explain yourself in detail uh, because all of those 911 calls are recorded, sure. and a lot of people have found out to their detriment that things they said off the cuff to a 911 operator were later held against them um, by a prosecutor um, or, or even uh, during a civil suit. So you have to be careful what you say. You should probably practice uh, saying uh, what you uh, what you should well, say. Give me an idea. Of what, you know, okay, you've just been in a shooting. You picked up your phone. You call nine one one. What are you going to say, Chris? Well, I'm going to say something like uh, um, there was uh, there was a shooting. Um, give the location where it is. Um, you can uh, at that point um, you can either say I shot. Uh, uh, somebody who was attacking me. Make, make sure that uh, uh, that you get across the fact that uh, uh, you were shooting in fear of your life and mm. to, to defend your life or, or the lives of uh, maybe family members who were with you. And uh, one of the things that uh, Clint Smith recommends is putting in there, and I want this guy arrested, even if you shot him dead. It sounds good on the mm-hmm. tape, because uh, only um, good the, citizens want right. other people arrested exactly. uh, for something like that. Then you want to describe yourself and where you, where you are, what clothes you're wearing, uh, you know, have you got a beard, are you wearing glasses, um, uh, are you bald, uh, have you got a full head of hair, all that sort of thing, right. uh, clothes that you're wearing, and, uh, um, and then uh, you can stay on the line, uh, they will encourage you to stay on the line, however, there is no legal requirement for you to stay and, on the line and, with 911. And, and, and I am going to rec- to- I'm going to recommend that you don't stay on the line because everything uh, everything you keep talking about is a chance for you to make a mistake. That's true. Yeah. I, I think uh, mostly I agree with that uh, with that point of view. It does depend and it uh, it was interesting um one of the stories that I tell, it's not strictly a concealed carry story, but um, Stephen Williford was the guy who shot the killer at the Southern Springs Baptist Church about right. a year ago. And uh, he, after that uh, happened, he chased the bad guy down, and eventually the bad guy committed suicide. But uh, uh, he said that uh, he gave... Uh, basically statements to seven different law enforcement agencies. Um, The shooting, uh, the Baptist Church was in Wilson County. Uh, I think it was Guadalupe County that the guy ended up in after Williford chased him with another guy. And uh, and then there was a third uh, um, jurisdiction close by, so he gave statements to three... um, deputy sheriffs. Then Mm -hmm. he was told to wait for the Texas Rangers. They're coming. He gave a fourth statement to them. ATF turned up, a fifth statement to them. He then went home, 
um, and there were a whole bunch of people there who'd heard about this. And uh, there was a knock on the door shortly after he got there, and one of his daughters answered the, uh, the door, and she said, the FBI and Homeland Security want to talk to you. And then she added, I never ever thought I'd say that. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> well, you know, and there, there's a risk there. And so that and, was seven statements right. by the time he was finished. The risk there is that you don't make the same statement to everyone, and then they say, well, you, who are you lying to? Are you lying to us or are you lying to them? That's right. That's right. And he said afterwards that his lawyer uh, told him, uh, you should not have really uh, given those statements without no. talking to me first. And uh, that is probably the best solution. In, in fact, it was such a, an obvious case uh, of, of him being in the right Correct. that uh, it didn't matter. Um, and I'm sure he told much the same story to each of them. Um, but uh, it, it's uh, certainly uh, something that you want to avoid doing. Um, you want to say, I was defending myself. I was scared to death. And uh, I, uh, I need to speak to my lawyer. Yeah. Uh, and, I would be happy to give you uh, full details, but I need to speak to him or her first. Right. And, and, and don't think for a minute that, that just saying, you know, I was in fear for my life is enough. Uh, Chris, uh, I'm going to be out of time here. How can people get a copy of the Concealed Handgun Manual 7th edition, which I highly endorse? Well, thank you, Tom. Um, yeah, you can get it uh, through, you can order it uh, through your bookstore. I believe uh, Barnes & Noble has them, uh, certainly through Amazon. Or if you want an autographed copy, you can uh, uh, call me directly on my uh, toll-free uh, line, which is 888-700-4333. All righty. Chris Bird, thank you so much. Great book. Highly recommended. Well done, my friend. Thank you, Tom. All righty. You take care. All right. 866-TALK-GUN. We'll get you in here. What kind of advanced training? What kind of basic training have you done? And do you keep up recurrent training? How important is it to you? How much do you enjoy it? I heard the click, click, click of her stiletto heels coming down the hall. And I caught a perfume before she opened the door to my office. And she stood there looking like a million bucks tax-free. I want to talk to you, she said. Come back later, I said. I'm listening to Tom Gresham's gun talk right now. All right, back with you. 866-TALK-GUN or just dial me at Tom Talk Gun. Let's see, where did that go? I just got... Oh, yeah. Uh, this r- comes in by email from Mike. He says, Tom, I had never understood what the big deal was with having a suppressor on a handgun or rifle until I went to my friends the other day. I got to fire his suppressed twenty twos and 9mm. Holy smokes, it was awesome. You could actually hear the rounds zipping through the air and the mechanics of the gun working. Now I want one, LOL. Have a great day. Looking forward to the show today. Uh, yeah, Mike, I understand. Once you go out and shoot a suppressor, you go, oh, now I get it. I just I, I didn't understand what the whole deal was about. And then when you do, you go, same deal. We all have the same reaction. Got to get one of those. Uh, let's see. we got uh, Joe and Brian. Don't go anywhere, Brian. We're going to get to you in just a sec. Uh, line three, Joe, uh, Jefferson, Texas. You did, got a range report for us, Joe. Hey, uh, Tom. Yeah, I took the Hackathorn Challenge that you offered last week, and oh, I went okay. out and tried it. And uh, but I think I missed one uh, one of the rounds. I know it was five shots: one at three, one at five, two at ten. I couldn't remember the other was at seven think, or what. But I think one whole, one's at seven. The the first one at three was to one hand only, and then one shot at five, two hands. One shot at seven, two hands, and then two shots. And all those were to head shots. And then the ten yard one was two shots to the torso. All to be done from concealment drawing, and it has to be done under two and a half seconds. Well, make a long story short, I the 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 one I had the hardest with was the three shot to the head. That was uh that was quite amazed me that I I didn't struggle at ten. That was not a problem. I practiced uh-huh. quite frequently. Uh, I didn't struggle with the others, but from uh, three yards, 
defeating the garment and getting to the head uh, was a little confusing to me because I couldn't decide whether to find my front sight or just point and shoot. Uh-huh. Uh, but I I was amazed that my tendency was to uh, discharge prematurely and go over the target. I did that a couple of different times, and it absolutely stunned me. Yeah. Okay, so what what is your takeaway from having done this drill and kind of it's all it really is is it's a self analysis drill, right? Well, I think with repetition, I would certainly become proficient, but it's something I haven't practiced. But it's a very it's a practical scenario uh, to think that mm-hmm. you'd have to you might mm-hmm. be encumbered in some way and can only fire with one hand and at that close range to the head to, to stop the threat yep. would be good. Well, but, well th- uh, think about if you if you got a hold of your loved one, you're grabbing your wife, uh, your kid, uh, somebody with one hand, you're grabbing them, sweeping them back behind you. you got to draw and fire with the other hand while you're holding on to your, you know, whoever it is to keep them away from the bad guy. That's a very realistic scenario. It was. I was quite surprised. It was a good exercise. Like I said, uh, two hands at, you know, 5, 7, and 10, not a problem. I do that all the time. Mm-hmm. But I was amazed I was missing it at three Interesting. yards. Interesting. Well, then it was worthwhile. It's, it's a good thing you did it. It is, was excellent. Absolutely yeah, worthwhile. All right. Thanks for the range report. That is excellent. Thank you, sir. Line four, Brian's with us out of Little Rock, Arkansas. Hey, Brian. Hey, how's it going? Great. Uh, I know just real quick here, I was going to say, I was listening uh, to your guy talking about the different concealed carry. Mm-hmm. Uh, several things here. First off, uh, in my opinion, and I have been a firearm instructor for a while, being scared of your life, uh, that is enough. You need to protect yourself at all times. And as far as the guy following the uh, the uh, suspect on that shooting in Texas, whatever, that's really not self-defense. If you're following the guy, when it comes to concealed carry, you're carrying a weapon to protect yourself. All right, it's not once it's over, you protect yourself, and there you go. Are, not, wait, wait, wait. Are, are you familiar with the case we're talking about? Uh, well, I'm familiar with the the guy shot the place up. Uh, I believe it's the church or something. Correct. Uh, in Texas, and he went and he followed the suspect. Well, he, first he sh- first he shot him, uh, shot the suspect, the murderer. Uh, as he came out of the church, so he shot him once there. Then this guy gets in the car, takes off, and this uh, Stephen Williford jumps in the car with another guy, and they're chasing him. They're not shooting at him. They're just chasing him and calling it in, making sure that the police get the report of where he is and what's going on. Yeah, no, I, I've done the same thing. I think it's great. But what I'm saying is you can't you can't lap that in with just your average concealed carry. Oh, I agree. Uh, yeah, no, no. You, 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 once it's over, it's over. You don't, you can't pursue somebody. But let me, I'm gonna circle back because you said, um, I made the point. I said, just saying you were in fear for your life is not enough to establish a defense. And you say it is. And here's why I say it's not. You still have to convince 12 people that that was a reasonable thing to do. You don't just get off because hey, I mean, otherwise there are people who actually think you can just go shoot somebody. And say, I was in fear for my life, and you get a cookie and you go away. Yeah, no, what I'm saying is, if you're in fear for your life, you better protect it, period. Oh, absolutely. I, I, we do not disagree. We're on the same page. All I'm saying is, from a legal standpoint, unfortunately, some people have been told, all you have to do is say, I was in fear for my life, and it's good. No, you still have to convince the police, the prosecutor, and maybe 12 people on a jury that they would have done the same thing or that that is a reasonable response. Because if they just say that's not a reasonable response, you're still going to suffer the legal consequences from it. Well, maybe I didn't hear the whole conversation. What I'm saying is if you're in fear for your life, you better protect it. If you're sitting here worried about whether or not the law is going to say anything by the time that is, it might be too late. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, we're, we're on the same page. Absolutely. I appreciate it. Yeah, and thanks for pointing that out. Maybe I didn't say that as elegantly as, as I could have. So, thank you, sir. Uh, oh, yeah. Quick break here. Ken, Stephen, don't go anywhere. We're going to get to you when we come back here. 866-TALK-GUN. I'm Tom Gresham.
Brown Nails has gone retro. Check out Brown Nails' new line of retro AR-15 and AR-style 308 rifles at brownnails.com slash retro. Whether you're looking for Eugene Stoner's original 308 design, the famous M16A1, Air Force 601, or the XM-177 carbine, Brown Nails has the classic, new production, old-school rifle of your dreams. Own the firearm you used in basic training, carried in service, or that Grandpa always talks about. See more at brownnails.com slash retro. Since 1937, Ducks Unlimited has led the charge on wetlands and waterfowl conservation. Wetlands reduce the effects of flooding and recharge our drinking water. But perhaps most importantly, they allow us to experience what makes the outdoors so great. Band together to rescue our wetlands. Line one, Ken's with us out of Medford, Oregon. Hey, Ken, you're on Gun Talk. What's up? Hey, I've been paying attention to the concealed carry and all of the things that they've been talking about, even with this book and the gentleman you talked to today. Mm -hmm. And I have taken a concealed carry class. I do not have my permit yet. I'm in the process of getting it. But my Mm -hmm. biggest question is, I have carried, open carried, a revolver most of my life. Mm. But carrying a semi-automatic pistol with one in the chamber, not having a safety on that weapon bothers me. Why? What's the situation with that? Well, why does it bother you? Well, for one does your, thing... Uh, does your revolver have a safety on it? No, but you have to pull the hammer back to make it work. No, you don't. Or are you carrying a single-action revolver? I do. So you're, okay, so that would it bother you to carry a double-action revolver? No. Why? Because the odds of that thing going off is slim and none versus a single, I mean, basically a, a semi-automatic with one in the chamber, no hammer. When you go to pull the thing out, it, <laughs> I'm going to say premature ejection, <laughs> but uh, it can go off. I understand. And- I understand. All right. Here, here's the source of your concern. It's like almost every fear we have, it's because we either don't know something, fear of the unknown, or we are simply not accustomed to it. Uh, I've carried pistols with no external safety on them for more than a decade. Uh, I also like 1911s that have external safeties on them. If you were to go to the range with an instructor with a pistol, a pistol being a semi-auto, with no safety on it, and get good training, and shoot 1,000 or 1,500 rounds, draw and shoot, draw and shoot, draw and shoot, draw and shoot, over and over and over again, at the end of that, you'd go, what's the big deal? I don't get it. It's just not an issue. Well, I'm, I'm thinking more in the terms of not necessarily the draw and shoot because I, I have not owned a semi-automatic pistol mm-hmm. or rifle uh, up until about the last two years. Okay. And I've done a lot of extensive training and practice at the range. I've had instructors working with me. I've done practice on my own. And the draw and fire doesn't bother me as much as having one in the chamber, no safety, and I'm carrying this thing, getting in and out of a car, bumping well, into somebody. I, I, guess, I guess. I, I guess. You know, I'm thinking. Well, what? First of all, you have to have a, a, a holster that is secure. You have to have a holster that covers the trigger guard. So, how's it going to go off? Well, that's what I'm worried about. <laughs> well, it's not going to. It, I mean, it, it, it is a. Physical impossibility. Nothing's going to pull the trigger because it's covered. Uh, th- they have internal safeties, like three of them built into these guns that don't have an external safety. There's still safeties on it. The trigger has to be pulled. It can't be. It can't just go off if you just drop it. It won't do that because there still is a safety built into the trigger mechanism. Um, but having said all that, there's nothing. There's no reason for you if you're thinking about getting a, a semi-automatic pistol. Why not get one that has a thumb safety on it then? Well, I actually went out. I have three different semi-automatic pistols. One, the first one I got was a an LCP Ruger 380, and uh-huh. I thought this would be perfect concealed carry gun. Um, but it didn't turn out to be that great a gun. 
Uh, it's lightweight, kicks like a mule. And, yeah, um, it, it's a specialist it, gun. It's it's made for deep concealment. It's not your generally. It's not a good everyday carry gun. I love it, but it has a very specific use. So yeah, you're right. Yeah. What'd you get next? So, then I got a HK VP9, which yeah. is an awesome weapon. Yes, and I was prepared to make that my concealed carry gun, other than the fact that it's a little bit large, but. It works flawlessly. It's easy to handle. I haven't had any issues with it whatsoever. But my concern was the safety. So I went out and bought a Smith & Wesson M&P Compact 22 that has a safety. But it's a 22 rim fire. And everybody told me it's 22 is not enough. No, it's not. not I mean, you, you already know that. You, you carry a, con, a center fire handgun for already so you already know that the 22 is not enough i I don't have to convince you of that now of course that leads me to if you like the m&p with an external thumb safety on it then just get one of those in a nine millimeter good to go do not and i'm just going to tell you do not carry with uh, an empty chamber because i want you to draw and shoot it one-handed right because the actual action Taking the time to have to rack the cylinder with her chamber, it, that would be stupid. Well, you know, not only that, you may not have an extra hand. You may be fighting this guy with one hand, and you have to draw your pistol and shoot it with one hand, and forget racking the slide. ain't going to happen. Yeah. Because with a revolver, I've never had that issue. One-handed, you know, pulling yeah. out single action. I, under- I understand. Fire. I think, you know, here's the thing. I think you have worked your way through the issue, and you've ended up at the gun. You're almost at the gun you want. If you like that M&P in 22, then get the same gun in 9mm or 40 or 45, whatever you like, and I think you've kind of honed in on what you need. It's different for each person. You figured it out for yourself. I, I I congratulate you, actually. I think you went about the process very intelligently. Look, I appreciate the call. i got to keep this thing moving here. Uh, let's see. Line three, Stephen, Sierra Vista, Arizona. Hey, Stephen, what's this about a potential attack? All right, Tom. Um, first, I want to just jump into it. Um, I was listening to your show, and I think you had one of your trainers from First Person Defender call in, Greg, and you guys were talking about this idea that if you feel like someone's following you or something's going mm-hmm. on, do something kind of out of the ordinary right. to confirm that suspicion. Right. So here's the the setup. It was about 10 o'clock at night. I was with my wife and our giant Doberman. We're going for a walk around this park. And the lights in the park were out. And it had just rained and the sprinklers were on. Mm-hmm. So we're going down the sidewalk. And this runner... This jogger comes by and just kind of breezes past us, which we didn't really think much of. Mm -hmm. But as we continue walking down to the corner of the park, we arrive, and I look down further down the road, and he's waiting at the corner there. Mm -hmm. And and so I thought, hmm, that's a little, you know, first uh, piqued my suspicion. Yeah. I was like, well, instead of doing a loop, we'll just walk back the way we came. But the Mm -hmm. minute that we started walking back that direction, he started jogging back towards us. Towards you, okay. Right. So that was the second um, strike. Yep. I was like, All right. I, I got about 30 scary. seconds, so go ahead and tell me what happened. All right. So, yeah, then, the, then I decided, all right, we're going to go for broke here, walk through the sprinklers, and just do something completely out of the ordinary. Right. And this guy it starts following us through the sprinklers. Ooh. And with my headlamp, I can see that there's a guy across the hiding in the field in the dark and that we just narrowly avoided uh, running two, into there, him. There's two so, of them. Guys wow. uh, laying in wait for us. Thankfully, I was carrying my concealed weapon, and we were able to avoid anything, but it was a close call. Excellent, excellent range report. Yeah, do something different. Change your pattern. Go somewhere else. But listen to that voice in your head that said something's not right here. They were setting you up for an ambush. Well done, Stephen. And you didn't have to use your gut because you used your head. All right. Richard is in San Antonio, line four. Hey, Richard, you're on Gun Talk. 
How are you? Yes, sir. I'm great. Um, just a little background. My first 14 years in the military, I was a firearms instructor, so I've lived every single day on the range and in armories. Okay. But I heard your previous caller having apprehension about carrying a round in the chamber. Uh, right. I carry the old-fashioned Walther PPS, and I carry one in the chamber. But something I heard on your show has actually enabled me to practice the Israeli draw mm -hmm. method, which is the eyesight target trainer. So uh, that might be something that he might want to learn and incorporate the eyesight because it conditions you uh, to, to be able to draw and charge your weapon to get around in the chamber. You know, it is a system. I'm not a fan uh, because, as I say, you know, if it's a gunfight, gun is the adjective, fight is the noun. You're actually in a fight. There's a, an excellent chance that you're actually fighting someone with your hands, and you may have to hold someone with one hand while you pull your gun and shoot the other. And the rack and the slide, not such a great plan at that point. No, it's not, but I just thought it was a viable option for someone who was adamant about not carrying one in the pipe. Yep. No, I, I think that's, you know, certainly a possibility. I appreciate you bringing it up. Thank you, sir. Let's talk to uh, Fran in Vermont, line three. Fran, M1 Carbine, talk to me. Yes, uh, AMT Long Slide. Have you ever had the pleasure of shooting that fireball? You're not talking about the uh, the AMT being the uh, a 1911, or are you talking about the uh, an actual it's M1 that Carbine? It's style. Yeah. But it's I have a company not. that was out in California, the AMT. Well, I remember AMT, but I never had a chance to shoot their pistol. They it, it was in the first Terminator movie there. Arnold in the police station there had one. Is that the forty four Magnum? Or no, 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 no. Thirty carbine. It was a thirty carbine. I'll be darned. Yeah. No, I've not shot that. It shoots a big old fireball and oh, every time I let somebody try it, they go, <laughs> I like it. Yeah, it's one of those you really want to shoot it at dusk when you get the full effect of like five feet of flame. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, the, I just uh, thought I'd bring up a blast from the past. That is absolutely that, Fran. Thank you. Yeah, it's kind of like that uh, Caltech uh, twenty two Magnum pistol. Uh, we were shooting at an indoor, indoor range and shooting on video. And every time we fired it, you got this donut of red fire, it was like, I don't know, six expanding to about 10 inches of a ring of fire with every single shot. It was like so cool. We just wanted to keep doing it, keep shooting video of it. It was just a hoot and a half. Let's see. Uh, Mark, line one, Houston. We've got about one minute for you, Mark. Dive in, please. Uh, yes, sir. I've got a F and H 40 cal, and it seems like my magazine is about three years old. Whenever I first start loading the magazine, it's real soft, and on the last two shells after shooting, sometimes the last shell will not load up into my gun. Ah. Now, do you have any recommendations of uh, replacing your magazine spring after yeah. X amount of time? No, not really. I uh, Generally speaking, springs don't take a set. Uh, but if you're experiencing that, then, yeah, just get new springs and, and swap them out. Uh, you can swap the sw springs out. It's one of the reasons I always tell you you need to have more magazines as well. Uh, I think six is a bare minimum for any semi-automatic firearm, period. I mean, anything. And I like to carry at least one and sometimes two spare mags when I'm carrying. But, yeah, if, it, if you're starting to see that, go ahead and swap the spring out. Uh, in fact, while, and while you're buying them, buy a couple of extras just to have them around. Not a bad idea. And thanks for bringing that up, Mark. Hey, if you'd like to be a part of the after show, call us right now, 866-TALK-GUN or Tom Talk Gun. We can get you in. If you haven't checked out the after show, then grab your Gun Dealio app on your smartphone, and you can listen to Gun Talk anytime you want. You can listen to the after show, which uh, you're not going to hear unless you listen to it as a podcast. In the meantime, get serious about your self-defense training. Your family is counting on you.